Order. The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and on indulgence, uh, last Tuesday when the House came together, we spent our first moments talking about the loss of Brett Wood. Today, unfortunately, just a week later, we need to mark the fact that overnight we have lost two more of our defence personnel in Afghanistan. At this stage, their names haven't been released to the public. Uh, that is in accord with the wishes of their families. So at the appropriate time, when their names are known, of course, we will have a condolence motion which honours them in full and honours the details of their service to the Australian nation. What we can say today, Mr Speaker, is that one man, an Australian Army officer, aged 27, lost his life when the helicopter he was in crashed. Five others were injured in that crash. They are in a satisfactory condition. He was not the pilot at the time, but he was a pilot, and he had been deployed in East Timor and also on Queensland Operation Flood Assist during the course of our very devastating summer when the work of the helicopters was just so important to Queensland communities in search and rescue, in evacuations and in ferrying supplies around. The second young man who lost his life lost it in a separate incident. He was 25 years old. He was at one of our forward patrol bases in the Chora Valley. He was on guard duty. He was there with an Afghan National Army soldier. And whilst the details are still not clear, it appears that the Afghan National Army soldier uh, shot and wounded the Australian soldier. And despite very prompt medical attention, he died from those wounds. The Afghan National Army soldier fled the scene. And of course, all steps are being taken to apprehend him. And the incident will be fully investigated. I understand that many Australians hearing the details of the incident which are available to date would feel a sense of puzzlement about why something like this would happen, would be asking themselves, well, given we're there to help, what explains this, that an Afghan National Army soldier would shoot and kill an Australian soldier? I think many in our community probably feel a sense of anger as they hear this news. Uh, as people go through those uh, emotions, what I would say to the Australian community is we do need to fully investigate this incident before we draw conclusions and before we start speculating about what this means for the circumstances of our deployment in Afghanistan. But, Mr Speaker, if I could conclude by saying the following two things. First and foremost today, Whatever details we learn about the helicopter crash or about this shooting in the future, first and foremost today, our minds are on the two Australian families who have been required to face up to this news overnight and in the early hours of this morning. Uh, they are bearing a huge burden and all of our thoughts and all of our good wishes are with them. Secondly, Mr Speaker, whilst I understand on hard days like this one the Australian community does uh, question uh, our involvement in Afghanistan, I think that's very natural and very understandable too. Uh, to Australian community members who are asking themselves that question, it is in our nation's interest to continue our deployment in Afghanistan, to see our mission through to make sure that Afghanistan does not again become a safe haven for terrorist training. If we were to leave a vacuum there in the security circumstances, we know who would fill it, Mr Speaker, and it would be terrorists from around the world. So we do need to see our mission through. But today, of course, the burden of the cost uh, lies on our shoulders and the shoulders of the Australian nation. But first and foremost, it lies on the hearts of the families <coughs> who are grieving today, and our thoughts are with them. The Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, I uh, rise to uh, support the remarks of the Prime Minister. On behalf of the uh, Coalition, I offer condolences to uh, the families of the soldiers who have been killed 
and uh, I express the Coalition's uh, continuing support for the mission on which those soldiers were engaged. Um, as the Prime Minister said, uh, there will be a time to consider the circumstances uh, under which uh, these deaths uh, have taken place to draw the appropriate conclusions, but I think there are uh, two observations that are worth making at this point in time. Uh, first, Mr Speaker, there is no such thing as uh, casualty-free combat, uh, and regrettably, as long as our, us, our soldiers are in Afghanistan, uh, there will be uh, sad moments for our country uh, and sad moments, uh, obviously, for this parliament. Second point to make, Mr Speaker, is that uh, serious countries don't slip out from under their responsibilities, no matter how hard those responsibilities become. Our soldiers should not stay in Afghanistan a moment longer than is absolutely necessary, but it is necessary that they stay while there is a vital task that only they can perform. Order. As a mark of respect, I invite members to rise in their places. I thank the House. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I inform the House that the Assistant Treasurer will be absent from question time today as he is unwell. The Treasurer will answer questions on his behalf. Order. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, this question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer the Prime Minister to the latest version of the Garno report, in particular uh, page 17, where this statement is made. Australian households will ultimately bear the full cost of a carbon price. Let me repeat that, Mr Speaker. Australian households will ultimately bear the full cost of a carbon price. So I ask the Prime Minister how can she continue to maintain that her tax only makes big polluters pay? The Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his reference to the Garno review, which Professor uh, Garno gave me earlier today and about which he has been speaking at the National Press Club. I have the review in my hand. It's the product of seven months' work, and I think we should thank Order. Professor Garno for Order. it as an Australian parliament and as an Australian nation. I don't anticipate that everybody Order. will agree with every view put forward by Professor Garno, but that shouldn't, that shouldn't stop us actually uh, that shouldn't stop us actually thanking him uh, for his work and respecting him in his professionalism in doing it. Uh, now, in answer Order. to the Leader of the Opposition's question, uh, given he's talked about the question of cost, uh, yes, Professor Garno makes some observations about costs. There's one on page 77 of this report, and it uses the terminology direct action, as the Leader of the Opposition would use to refer to Order. his uh, refer to his policy. Uh, I would refer Order. to it as a policy in which polluters are subsidised. But Professor Garno says this, using direct action measures to achieve similar amount of emissions reduction would raise costs. Order. The Leader Order. of the Opposition may the be member interested for in these words. Would raise costs much more than carbon price but would not raise the revenue Order. to offset the or reduce the costs the in Prime any Minister of these will ways. Resume her place. Order. 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 The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition's question couldn't have been more specific. It quoted a sentence from the Garno Review and it asked the Prime Minister how she could continue to maintain that only the biggest polluters would pay. After quoting from the Garno Review, the Prime Minister is not even attempting order. to answer that question. 
I would ask Order. you to bring the her back to the question. Manager of Opposition Business will resume his seat. At the time the member approached the dispatch box, the Prime Minister was relating a further reference in the report to carbon pricing. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And you, uh, my, my point is basically this, that if you want to look at the Garneau review, then you should look at all of it. And what he does say, what he does Order. say about the measures Order. proposed by the Leader Order. of the Opposition is that they would raise costs much more than a carbon price, but would not raise the revenue to offset or reduce the cost in any of these ways. The costs might be covered by budgetary expenditure, but this affects who pays the costs, not whether the costs are there. Order. Other people's taxes have to rise to pay Order for expenditures for under direct action. So, Mr Speaker, what Professor Garno is putting there and what is a clear contrast between the policy the government stands for and the, the Leader of the Braden. Opposition's policy is we are putting the a member for price Sturt is on warned. carbon that big polluters would pay. The member we are for putting Braden a price on carbon that big polluters would pay. We've always been clear about that. Big polluters would pay the price member and for by paying that price they would have the incentives they need to act to reduce the carbon pollution that they emit. We have also been very clear with Australian families, and I said this when I first outlined the carbon pricing mechanism to the Australian community, that there will be price impacts that flow through to Australian households. And that's why we will use uh, the majority of the revenue raised from pricing carbon to assist Australian households with those uh, impacts to generously assist Australian families who need that assistance the most. And we will use the remainder of the revenue to protect Australian jobs and to fund programs which help our move to being a clean energy economy. As Professor Garno says, the Leader of the Opposition's plan is about putting costs directly onto the shoulders of Australian taxpayers, that is, onto the shoulders of Australian families without any compensation at all. The Leader of the Opposition on a supplementary. Again, again, again to the Prime Minister, Mr Speaker. I mean, before the election, the Prime Minister said that there would be no carbon tax under the government I lead, and we know that that's wrong. Uh, now she says uh, that only the big polluters will pay, and we know Order. that's wrong because. The... Order. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Order. The Leader of the House on a point of order. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question has to be just that a question. Order. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. The Leader of the Opposition. Order. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister was deceptive before the election. She said just a moment ago in her answer. She said just a moment ago in her answer that only. The big polluters will pay, but we have here on page 17 of the Garno report the Australian households leader of the opposition will resume the his seat. Order! Why are they so embarrassed about this question? Order! Order! The leader of the house will resume his seat. The Leader of the House on a point of order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It goes to standing orders and the standing order that requires no argument. We have had 36 seconds from the Leader of the Opposition and not a resemblance, not a resemblance. If we want, if we want to have the suspension of standing orders that we get every day at 10 to 3, order. so he can talk the for 10 leader minutes, of the House he should come do to his so. Point of order. But the question order. is out of order. Order!
English expression may not have been my best subject at school, but the, it is true that there has not been yet a question mark. But the Leader of the Opposition has the call. It is an extremely long preamble, but he has the call. Order! The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Given that the Prime Minister has been caught out yet again, this time by her own report, how can anyone believe anything that this Prime Minister says? Order. 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 The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And can I say to the Leader of the Opposition, just because you bellow things doesn't make them right. And once again, here we have the Leader of the Opposition deliberately, deliberately uh, not telling the truth to the Australian community. He's just, said, he's just said to me, your report. Order. The Prime Minister will resume her place. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. And the Prime Minister should withdraw the imputation against the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Speaker. The order. 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 The expression used was an expression that's been allowed. And I simply say that I would hope that this exchange, both the question and the answer, is the end of the overly used debate in both questions and answers. As I've said before, the simplest matter that the House could do is to change the standing order so that there is no debate allowed in both questions and the answer. Having allowed the debate in the question, I've indicated before that that opens the door. The Prime Minister will now respond. The Manager of Opposition Business on a further point of order. Mr Speaker, the phrase used by the Prime Minister is one that I and the member for Indi were only asked to withdraw just last, I think it was last Thursday, uh, and I'd ask you to ask the Prime Minister to withdraw because accusing somebody of deliberately not telling the truth is the same as accusing someone of being a liar. And I'd ask you to withdraw. Ask her to withdraw it. Order. The Prime Minister has the call. I am not. I am not. I have given my ruling. Order. Order. The member for Bennelong may be a newcomer, but he should be very careful. Very careful in reflecting by way of interjection. Order. 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 The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And my very simple point was in his question to me, the Leader of the Opposition referred to this as my report. It is not my report. It is Professor Garno's report. And I believe he deserves the respect that should be shown to an expert who has acted, I believe, in the interests of the Australian nation by spending a very concentrated period putting this work together, and it is very good work. And I would recommend reading it to people who are interested in tackling climate change and interested in the facts about how we address climate change in this nation. But this is Professor Garno's report. We are a government that is always happy to accept and see the advice of experts. Then when you look at the advice of experts, you absorb it and you respond to it. Now I know actually seriously working through an issue is not the opposition's strong suit. 
but I do recommend to them that they seriously work through Professor Garno's report. And what they will find when they work through Professor Garno's report is it very, very clearly makes the case, as an economist, that the most efficient way of dealing with cutting carbon pollution is to put a price on carbon. And for people who say they are concerned about cost of living pressures on Australian families, this report very clearly makes the point that if you go down a different road, particularly the road that the Leader of the Opposition refers to as direct action but which is really about subsidising polluters, that that is a more costly road to go down. So if you care about the cost of living circumstances of Australians, you would reject that costly path and you would accept the advice of Professor Garno and many other economic experts that the cheapest way of cutting carbon pollution is to put a price on carbon. And clearly the member for Wentworth could assist the opposition in understanding that proposition. So it is the government's intention, as I have outlined time oh, and time Goldson. before in this House, I've outlined again today and I'm happy to outline further. Our intention <laughs> is to put a price on carbon from the 1st of July next year. That price on carbon will be paid by big polluters. Because they now have a price on carbon, they will innovate and they will change the way they work to create less carbon pollution. We will take a section of that revenue and assist Australian households. What that means is big polluters pay and Australian households get the assistance. The Leader of the Opposition's plan is to take more tax off Order. Australian families and give it to the big polluters in a plan we know will not work, courtesy of the words of the member for Wentworth. So I'd say to the Leader of the Opposition, rather than the fear campaign, rather than the cheap political points, actually read all of it think about it, move away from this path of negativity and actually try and make a contribution to this debate. Before calling the member for Robinson, I acknowledge that we have in the gallery the Hon. Jim Lloyd, a former member for Robinson and a former minister for local government territories and roads. Order. So, I, I'm not the author of the timing, but anyway, the member for Robertson has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister update the House on the government's efforts to undertake vital reform in tackling climate change and delivering the national broadband network? The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Robertson Order. for her question, Order. and I thank the member for Robertson for her high-quality advocacy of the needs and interests of her constituents in this parliament. Now, the uh, member has, has uh, directed to me a question which raises two important reform areas to keep our economy strong. We want Australians to have the benefits of a strong economy. We particularly want Australians to have the benefits of being able to get a job, which is why we are proud that 750,000 jobs have been created since the government was first elected, and we look forward to the creation of half a million more over the next couple of years. But keeping your economy strong always requires you to have a continuing reform agenda to keep walking the reform road. And we are engaged in reforms which are important to keeping our economy strong. Putting a price on carbon is important to keeping our economy strong and ensuring that we have got the clean energy jobs of the future. Last week I received the report of the Climate Commission, the critical decade. It said unambiguously the science was in. Today I received the report of Professor Garno and he says in Member his Patangi. report unambiguously that pricing carbon is an economic reform where the benefits far outweigh the costs. He tells us a fixed price followed by a carbon trading scheme is the best path forward to reduce the dangers of climate change 
without damaging the, the prosperity of the Australian nation. He talks about how pricing carbon is the lowest cost way of tackling climate change and dealing with carbon pollution. Now, I know that those opposite dispute the science. They don't believe in climate change. I know they refuse to look at, in a serious way, the works of serious economists like Professor Garno, but that is what he finds. Then, of course, continuing to keep our economy strong also means we need to have access to the infrastructure that our competitor nations will have, and that is national broadband. That is national broadband that enables us to move information at the same speed that people are moving it in economies with which we compete. The construction of the NBN is only the first step in that reform journey to make sure that we have the productivity benefits that come with this new technology. That's why today the government released the Digital Economy Plan. It's a roadmap of how we'll build the digital economy, and a key part of it is how we will aim to be one of the top five OECD nations for the use and take-up of broadband by 2020. It also has important measures so that we will support small businesses and not-for-profit organisations in the first 40 communities to fully utilise the opportunities that the NBN brings. And we will also be investing in education to make sure that students, whether they be in schools or TAFEs or universities, have the full benefit of the national broadband network. In all of these reforms, whether it's climate change or the NBN, we'll focus on the facts, Mr Speaker. We won't allow ourselves to be distracted by the diversions, and we will always act in the national interest. Order the member for North Sydney. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer the Treasurer to his own economic note of three days ago where he said, and I quote, only the biggest polluters, less than 1,000, will pay for the pollution they emit. Does the Treasurer agree with the Prime Minister that Ross Garno is, quote, a serious economist, and therefore does he agree with Professor Garno, who just said, and I quote, Australian households will ultimately bear the full cost of a carbon price. The order, order. The question has been asked. Order, order, order. The deputy prime minister, the treasurer. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think Mr. Garno has produced an excellent report, and of course, it is the policy of. Uh, this side of the house, that the biggest polluters will pay the price on carbon, Mr. Order. Speaker, and of course Order. we'll use every cent from that price paid Member to assist Gold. households mm. and to assist industry, Mr. Speaker. And there couldn't be a clearer contrast with the other side. The other side, the other side, want to tax households to pay big polluters. That's the policy on that side of the house, Mr. Speaker. And of course, the authority for that is not Professor Garno, it's the member for Wentworth. The member for Wentworth, in his interview uh, last week, made the point that a direct action policy such as they have the is the policy you have when you're not serious about dealing seat. with climate. The Treasurer resume his seat. The order, order, the manager of opposition business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, the Treasurer has asked whether he agreed with either Professor Garno or the Prime Minister's statement that only the big polluters will pay. He wasn't asked anything about any member of the opposition, and I'd ask you to draw him back to the very straightforward question he was asked. Order. The Treasurer will directly relate the material he is using to the question. The Treasurer. Yes, Mr Speaker. Well, the government has a policy of a market-based mechanism. It's the most efficient mechanism. It's Order. the least cost mechanism. Order. And those on Order. the other side of the House, those Order. on the other side those of the House, those on my Speaker. left. Order. Order. The Treasurer has the call. Order. Order. The Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the Opposition. The treasurer has the call. Mr Speaker, I know why they are so embarrassed, because the Shadow Treasurer used to have a policy for a market-based mechanism as well. He used to support the member for Wentworth. 
on a market order. The Treasurer returned to the question. Of course, question. we know when he changed his mind. It's when he put it on order. Twitter and asked everybody to tell him order. what his the convictions were, Mr. Speaker. Sydney. Mr. Speaker, so that we on this side of the House do support a market-based mechanism. A market-based mechanism, order. Mr. Speaker, which will the price carbon of the for the 1,000 largest polluters and use the revenue to assist households. What they want to do is to increase the tax on average taxpayers and give the money to the biggest polluters, Mr Speaker. We have not seen a serious policy from those on that side of the House in three and a half years, Mr Speaker. Order. And the Shadow Treasurer, the Shadow the Treasurer, Treasurer will last year put forward a proposal which Order. was found to have the biggest costing bundle Order. seen in political history. If the member for North be Sydney would just be quiet, he House. would have learnt that I asked the Treasurer to return to the question. But he is so noisy that he can't even hear anything else. The Treasurer will directly relate his remarks to the question, and those on my left will sit in silence. Treasurer. Well, Mr Speaker, those on that side of the House are so bereft of policy, there's nothing left for them to do but Order. to run baseless scare Order. campaigns, Mr. Speaker, and that's what they're Order doing. The treasurer, question after treasurer. question. The member for Morton. Order. The member for Morton has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Will the Minister update the House on the government's receipt of Professor Garno's update of his climate change review? How has the update been received, and what is the government's view? The Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the uh, member for Morton for his question. And as the House has heard, of course, uh, Mr. Speaker, Professor Garno has today released his uh, final update into his study into climate change and how the government and the country should best respond to this important challenge. And Mr Speaker, Professor Garno's update makes it absolutely clear that climate change is occurring, that it's caused by human activity, and that it poses a serious risk to the prosperity and quality of life of all Australians. And for the benefit of the member for Tangney, he states the following in his report. Since 2008, advances in climate change science have broadly confirmed that the earth is warming that human activity is the cause of it and that the changes in the physical world are likely, if anything, to be more harmful than the earlier science had suggested. Now, of course, the quality of the contribution from the member for Tangney, of course, made last week in suggesting that there had been no warming in the last decade, despite the empirical evidence being emphatic that it was the warmest decade on record, is testament to the control of those opposite by the climate science deniers. And of course, we know the influence that Senator Order. Minchin has over the Leader of the Opposition in this respect. The views that Senator Garno has expressed on the climate science is based on expert oh. advice. It is consistent with advice received by the government from sources including the CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology, the Climate Commission, and the Australian Academy of Science. And any government taking its public policy responsibility seriously to act in the national interest must respond to this challenge. Mr Speaker, it will also come no surprise to the House, I think, or to economists generally, that anyone wanting to act on climate change, uh, that Professor Garneau's proposed solution to this challenge is a carbon price, of course, delivered through a market mechanism. Uh, in his words in the report, he says the following. Market-based approaches to mitigation can bring out the best in Australians and a return Order. to regulatory approaches the worst. And furthermore, Professor Garno had the following to say about the Coalition's subsidies for polluters policy in his speech to the National Press Club today. He said the following. Direct action for reducing carbon emissions is likely to be immensely more expensive than a market approach and in fact went on to make the obvious, obvious observation about a subsidies policy, Order. that it is in the worst traditions of old protectionism, subsidies and anti-market philosophy. And that's exactly where the Leader of the Opposition sits. Subsidies for the big polluters, 
no revenue to assist households with the slug on taxes that they will be hit with. And of course, this is not a view that is that is shared by all of those who are associated with the Liberal Party. We know what the views of the member for Wentworth and many others are on the other side of the House. But we know too that former Prime Minister John Howard understands and respects the science, that he understands and respects the need for a market for mechanism, having taken emissions trading scheme to the, the election in 2007. We heard from Dr John Hewson yesterday. We heard from Dr Hewson that a market mechanism is the best position. We heard from Malcolm Fraser supporting a market mechanism to tackle this problem. You are lacking in the necessary responsibility as a public, holding a public political leadership position over this. It is time that the opposition and the leader of the opposition took this issue seriously and made a serious contribution and an effort Order. to this debate. Minister's time has expired. Order. 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 The member for Tangney. Order. Member for Melbourne Port. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer, refer her to page 77 of Professor Garneau's latest report, which says, and I quote, and I hope she listens carefully to this, every dollar of revenue from carbon pricing is collected from people. In the end, mostly households, ordinary Australians. Most of the costs will eventually be passed on to ordinary Australians. That's the quote from Professor Garneau. So I ask the Prime Minister, how can Order. she maintain Order. the pretense Order. How can she possibly Order. maintain the pretence that only a thousand big polluters will pay her toxic tax? Order. Order. Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I have the page of the Garno report that the Leader of the Opposition refers to, and it won't surprise anyone in this parliament to know that he is misrepresenting no. the force of oh, Professor again. Garno's words. Again. Misrepresenting the force of Professor Garno's words. Uh, when Order. you read these Order words, the when you read these words, trying to understand them and digest them and think about them in the national interest, rather than trying to clip a few out to use for a petty political agenda, what you actually find when you read Professor Garno's words is this and this very clearly. Professor Garno, Professor Garno the is there uh, contrasting and comparing the costs for Australian households of two ways of pricing carbon. The way that the government is talking about by putting a price on carbon which businesses pay, or the way that the Leader of the Opposition is talking about through regulatory mechanisms. He is comparing and contrasting those two approaches. And he very, very clearly concludes the Leader of the Opposition can't rely on one sentence in this document and not use the force of every other sentence. He very, very clearly concludes that the mechanism the Leader of the Opposition is advocating is more costly for Australian households. So let me, uh, let me, read, let me read the Order. quote. Using Order. direct action measures to achieve a similar amount of emissions reduction would Order. raise costs the much Prime more than carbon Prime Minister will resume her seat. Prime Minister resume her seat. Prime Minister. Order. Order the member for Morton. Order. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Yes, Mr Speaker. It was a very simple question about who pays, big polluters or households. Order. And the truth is, it's order households. The the That's the point. And she should be directly seat. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Order. Having made his point of order, he then cannot proceed to debate. The Prime Minister is responding to the question, the Prime Minister. 
Thank you very much. And I refer to the section of the report that the Leader of the Opposition referred to, to ensure that rather than having it misrepresented in this place, people understand what Professor Garno is putting here. And what he puts very clearly, these are his exact words, using direct action measures to achieve a similar amount of emissions reduction Order. would raise costs much more than carbon pricing, but would not, but would Order. not raise the Order. revenue to offset or reduce Order. the costs in any of these ways. Order. The costs might be covered by budgetary expenditure, but this affects, affects who pays the costs, not whether the costs are there. Other people's taxes have to rise to pay for expenditures under direct action. Well, who are those other Order. people whose taxes Order. have to rise? Order. Well, they're probably better known to the Australian Order. community Order. as mums and dads with jobs who would need to pay the taxes that the opposition leader would need, the increased taxes he would need, in order to subsidise big polluters. What we have said consistently, and Professor Garno makes this point too, what we have said consistently is you put a price on carbon pollution. Big polluters pay that price. We've always been very clear indeed that there would be some price impacts, which is why we take revenue from pricing carbon and we generously assist households who need it the most. And I've said that many, many times before. The Leader of the Opposition may only have just heard it. A generously assist households who would need Order. that assistance the most. Member so the difference, here, the difference here is more tax for Australian families, no assistance, compared with a price on the biggest polluters and using that money to assist households. I suggest the Leader of the Opposition, instead of looking at the occasional word in Professor Garno's report, reads the whole lot. Order. The order. Order. The member for Morton yet again. Order. The Leader of the Opposition. Yes, Mr Speaker. Yesterday the Prime Minister said this price wouldn't Order. be paid by households. What? It would be paid what by is the thousand biggest leader of the opposition I seek leave. I seek leave to table this document is leave which granted. shows that the leave Prime is Minister is granted. deceiving leave this is House. Not granted. Order. 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 Before giving the call to the member for Kennedy, I inform members that we have in the gallery this afternoon, Mr Sergeant Day Ajavid, my apologies, Sergeant, the Parliamentary Private Secretary to the Minister for Further Education, Skills and Lifelong Learning in the UK and the MP for Bromsgrove. He is a guest here under the Special Visitors Program, and on behalf of members, I extend to him a very warm welcome. The member for Kennedy. Question without notice to Minister Burke. Could the minister assure the House for more humane processing in the three South East Asian Meatworks media targeted yesterday? Could the minister further assure the House that we are not going to impose our religious beliefs and values on our neighbours? Is the minister aware that an estimated one third of Indonesia goes to bed hungry every night? That these people are not allowed to fish in our waters nor prawn farm our empty land? And since an ox processed in Australia costs $7,500, precluding purchase by any Indonesian, in light of this minister, wouldn't they be entitled to say, fair go, mate? Could the minister advise, since it will no longer pay to provide water and feed how our nature lovers intend to deal with cattle now dying, could the minister finally advise the House parading, these people parading as nature lovers to watch the Order. worldwide nature program, National Order. Geographic, as advertisement one of time an animal ripping another to pieces? expired. <clears throat> Having, having, having given himself extra time by referring to the minister as Minister Burke, I give the call to the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities. Um, but the minister has the call. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Kennedy for the question uh, in my capacity here representing the Minister for Agriculture. Uh, I do appreciate the, the perspective and the concerns of the electorate of Kennedy uh, when anything relates to the live export industry. Uh, I've been with the member. I, 
Oh, I've been with the member for Kennedy, Kennedy uh, in Normanton and Cloncurry and met with uh, some of the some of the graziers and pastoralists there. Uh, it's a similar story across much of the north of Australia, going across through uh, the Northern Territory and into Western Australia. Uh, there are a large number of jobs, family businesses and Indigenous employment operations which are underpinned by very large pastoralist industries. It is also true that the the reason that this debate has taken off in such a way uh, over the last 24 hours is the footage that was on television last night was just awful. Uh, and I felt that watching it. I'm sure every Australian felt that, and I'm sure every farmer felt that as well. Uh, I note the comments that have been made by the New South Wales Farmers Association already about the distress that many of them have felt, many of their members have felt, in seeing their own stock treated in the way that we saw at a number of establishments last night. The footage was only made available to the Minister for Agriculture shortly before that program went to air. In that time, a number of actions have been taken, and shortly before we went to question time, the Minister for Agriculture provided a detailed media conference where, where he went through the gravity of uh, what had been cited and also of the specific actions which he had already undertaken and the further actions which he has left the way open for. Uh, suffice to say that the establishments that have been involved and have been cited in that footage, those specific establishments, Australian farmers do expect that their stock will be treated better than that. The Australian people expect that animals originating from Australia will be treated better than that, and the actions taken thus far by the Minister have centred on those specific establishments. The member for North Sydney. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. I refer him again to the words of Professor Garner in his report when he says, and I quote, in the long run, Households will pay almost the entire carbon price as businesses pass carbon costs through to the users of their products. Will the Treasurer now admit that he has misled the Australian people just last Sunday when he said, and I quote, only the biggest polluters, less than 1,000, will pay for the pollution they emit? The Order the Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer. Yes, uh, Mr Speaker, what we've got is yet another example of just how shallow the Shadow Treasurer is. Hey, by the day he gets more hollow, Mr Speaker. We have been very clear about what we are doing in pricing carbon, Mr Speaker. And of course the price is paid by the 1,000 largest producers, Mr Speaker. And of course there will be price impacts, and that is why we have said every single cent, every single cent will go to households and will go to industries and will go to programs to drive renewable energy, Order. Mr Speaker. Every single cent will go in that direction. But of course, Mr Speaker, there is no credibility left on that side of the House, not when it comes to the Shadow Treasurer and of course not when it goes to the Leader of the Opposition. The Shadow Treasurer was once a believer in a price on carbon. But his situation has got so bad, he now has to write performance appraisals for the Financial Review, Mr Speaker, saying how good he is, because he's become a hollow man, Mr Speaker. There is no alternative the policy on that side of the House, to the Speaker. Question. What they do have is a policy they call direct action. And of course, what that policy does is that it taxes consumers, it taxes households and gives the benefits to the biggest polluters, Mr Order. Speaker. The that's what Treasurer it does. Resume and that's his what place. So Treasurer, Treasurer, resume his place. The member for North Sydney on a point of order. Again, Mr Speaker, it goes to relevance. The Treasurer was asked a simple question about his own words versus those of Professor Garner, not anything else. Order. The member for North Sydney yeah. resume his place. I've indicated that I would desire the Treasurer to relate his material to the question. And, oh, the Treasurer has finished. The member for Page. Order! 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 The 
The member for Page. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities. Will the minister please inform the House of the government's response to recent reports of the appalling treatment of animals in abattoirs in Indonesia? Yeah. The minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Speaker. I want to thank the member for Page for the question uh, and acknowledge in similar terms to the job opportunities that I referred to across the north of Australia, uh, there are many members uh, on, on this side of the chamber and some, some over there as well, with very significant meatworks within their electorates, who are very conscious of wanting to make sure that we maximise opportunities for the processing and downstream processing jobs in Australia, as well as the animal welfare concerns which were aired last night. Uh, and the member for Page has been pursuing these issues uh, very strongly for quite some time. As I said a moment ago, anyone who saw that footage last night uh, would have been horrified. The footage was just awful, and Australian farmers have been quite distressed by it as well. Shortly before question time, uh, Minister Ludwig, the Minister for Agriculture, put forward the initial response uh, on behalf of the government. As I say, he was presented with this footage shortly before the program went to air. Uh, but shortly before question time was able to go through the responses which the Australian people would expect we would have to what has been presented overnight. First of all, to ask the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry to conduct an immediate investigation into the specifics of the footage. Next, to announce that the government will appoint an independent reviewer to investigate the complete supply chain for live exports up to and including the point of slaughter. Next, to ask for himself to receive a briefing on the full range of legislative and regulatory options which are available to respond to issues concerned with animal welfare. In the interim, Minister Ludwig has asked for orders to enforce the suspension of live animal exports to the facilities which were identified. Uh, by the evidence which was broadcast last night. The Minister will also add further facilities to the banned list in the future if required. He's implemented a moratorium on the installation of the restraint boxes that were seen being used in the footage. This will apply to the instalment of any new boxes with Commonwealth funds across all global markets. He's also asked the Chief Veterinary Office, Officer, the Chief Vet, to coordinate an independent scientific assessment of the restraint boxes which are under use in Indonesia. Following the completion of this work, the government will consider what further actions may be necessary. The government does share the legitimate concerns of the Australian community about animal welfare abuses and, and is taking the necessary action to investigate the, the footage. I thank the member for Page for raising the issue. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer confirm that under Professor Garneau's proposal, compensation for business will reduce from 35 per cent to 20 per cent over 10 years? How does the Treasurer expect struggling manufacturers to survive against overseas competitors who don't pay a carbon tax when the government is almost halving compensation Order. for Australian businesses. Order. The Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer. Well, Order. Order. The Treasurer has the call. It sounds like the member for Curtin wants to make a comeback as the Shadow Treasurer, Mr Speaker. The treasurer. Treasurer. But anyway. Order. Order. Minister. Minister for Regions. Order. The Treasurer has the call. Mr Speaker, as, um, as the Prime Minister has indicated, as the Minister for Climate Change has said, we think this is a very good report from Professor Garno. And it's a very important report, so there can be a thorough community debate about dealing with dangerous climate change Mem and its Member impact not just on our environment, but on our economy. And of course, it's a serious piece of work. And it's a serious piece of work which feeds in to the work that the government is doing with the multi-party committee, with the business community and, of course, with the wider community. 
So we will take that on board as we go through developing the emissions trading scheme, Mr. Speaker, based on the principles that have already been announced by Order. the Prime Minister and the Minister for Climate Change. But of course, what we've got in here today is the pretence that somehow, somehow the government has already taken all those decisions. Well, we haven't. And what they want to do is to go out there and run a scare campaign. And why are they running a scare campaign? Because they're so acutely embarrassed about their lack of policy, Mr Speaker. There's no economic policy. They've been coming into this House calling for an election, despite the fact that their election policy from last year had a $10 billion hole in it, Mr Speaker. Treasurer, resume his seat. Order the Treasurer. Order. Order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I asked about struggling manufacturers who have to compete against overseas competitors who don't pay a carbon tax when the government has been advised to halve the compensation, almost halve the compensation to business over 10 years. Order. I asked the Treasurer to order. answer the, that question. The yeah. Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume her seat. Order! 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 Order the Leader of the Opposition. Order the Treasurer has not got the call. Treasurer! 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 Order! Order! Both the Treasurer and the Leader of the Opposition. Order the Member for Goldstein. Order the, the Treasurer can resume his seat whilst the House comes to order. Order the Leader of the Opposition, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Order, well, I'm happy to wait. Who, was that somebody inviting me to send them off? Um, the Treasurer has the call and he understands the requirements that he has to keep in mind in making his response. He's responding, the Treasurer. Well, Mr Speaker, we take our responsibilities on this side of the House very seriously, unlike those Order. opposite, Mr Speaker. And we are going in a methodical way about producing a policy which deals with dangerous climate change and protects our economy for the future. Unlike those opposite, unlike those opposite who simply want to tax Australian families and hand the money Order. to large polluters, Mr Order. Speaker. We've got a serious policy process in Order. train for the benefit Treasurer. of the country, Mr Speaker, and Treasurer. we're proud of what we're doing, Order. unlike those opposite who can only run a cheap scare campaign. The member for Greenway. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Given today is World No Tobacco Day, what support is the government receiving in its efforts to implement anti-tobacco measures, such as introducing plain packaging and reducing tobacco company influences? And what is the government's response? The Minister for Health and Ageing. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Greenway for her question. People might have uh, heard the member for Greenway this morning talking about her earlier habit as a young woman, smoking and choosing the packet that was the most glamorous one, uh, and the fact that she's been able to quit that habit and now is supporting the introduction of plain packaging, a world first. Uh, I think on World No Tobacco Day, it's an appropriate time to congratulate all of those campaigners who for years and years have been calling on governments to take this action. And I'm very proud to be part of a government that is taking this action. And I want to congratulate the Leader of the Opposition. I know he doesn't normally like listening to me here at the dispatch box, uh, but, but, this, but this might be an occasion where he wants to, Order. because I'd like to congratulate the Leader of the Opposition for finally declaring that he's going to do the right thing and that the Liberal Party will support this measure when it comes into the parliament. But even more importantly, I want to congratulate the member for Moore, the member for Hasluck. I want to congratulate the member for Fairfax. There were many members on the Liberal Party backbench who finally brought the Leader of the Opposition to this position. It was against his instincts. His instincts are to say no. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it, but he has been forced to do it by the weight of evidence Order. that this is the right thing to do. 
The so I am pleased Cowan. that the Leader of the Opposition the has decided Bowman. to support this measure and I want to congratulate him for Order. that. I do think on World No Tobacco Day there is a remaining habit that he needs to kick and that is a habit that goes to the receipt of tobacco donations. Because I need to be able to, uh, I need to, be able to tell the House... Order. The House will come to order. The Minister for Health has the call. I want Minister. to report to the House that the uh, AMA last week. Order, presented... those on my left. Order. The... Order, the member for Chifley. Order. The Minister has the call. She should be heard in silence. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I wanted to report to the House that uh, on Friday last week the AMA presented its tobacco awards. And, uh, I'm pleased that our government was the recipient of one of those rewards, but another government was the recipient. We shared the AMA award for tackling tobacco. And I want to uh, tell you that the AMA presented an award to a state government for their actions. And I want to give you a quote. And this quote says, I do not support receiving donations from tobacco companies. That's the position we had at the last state election, and it is the position we will maintain. Now, these comments from the West Australian Liberal Premier, Colin Barnett, earned him the award from the AMA for resisting the influences of big tobacco who are donating in large amounts to the Liberal and National Party. Far from being uh, embarrassed about this, the Leader of the Opposition went on television last week and said not only were people welcome to donate to the Liberal Party, but he would invite them to donate more. It seems that British American Tobacco giving 97 per cent of their donations to the Liberal Party is not enough, that they want 100 per cent of the donations from British American Tobacco. Obviously, we are delighted that the Liberal Party has seen what is the right thing to do. We want to congratulate the opposition for coming to their senses, and I personally would like to nominate British American Tobacco for a Guinness Book of Records award for an own goal. The only reason we've been talking so much about this for the last two weeks is because Mr Crow went out and gave an extraordinary press conference, which ultimately led to the Leader of the Opposition being so embarrassed that he's changed his position. The member for Macquarie. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer confirm that under Professor Garno's, Professor Garno's proposal, a typical single income family with two or three children and with one, one partner earning $80,000 per annum will get no compensation for the government's carbon tax. Order. 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 The House will come to order. The, that includes the Minister for Regions. The Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer, has I the I thank call. the member for Macquarie for that question because what she has said is entirely baseless. Entirely That'd baseless, be right. Mr. Speaker, because we have not completed the design of the scheme. So it's a continuation of the scare campaign that we're seeing from those opposite, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, they've been fond of uh, quoting Professor Garno, so I would just like to quote from page 77 of the report when he talks about the opposition's so called direct action option. He says this, other people's taxes have to rise to pay for expenditures under direct <coughs> action. In the long run, households will pay almost the entire carbon price as businesses pass carbon costs through to the users of their products. That's Mr Garner. Order. The Mr. Garner's Treasurer of their so seat. The Treasurer resume his seat. Has the Treasurer concluded? Order. Order. The House will come to order. The member for Blair. Thank you, Deputy Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House in today's balance of payment numbers and what they mean for the economic outlook? The Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer. Yes, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for Blair for this very important question because 
Today's balance of payments figures do show the very dramatic impact on both the economy and, of course, our exports of recent natural disasters, particularly in Queensland. It's appropriate that that question is asked by the member for Blair, and there are plenty of members on this side of the House whose communities were dramatically impacted. Uh, not just the economic impact, but the social impact, and of course many over there on the other side of the house in Queensland who felt the full brunt, not just of the floods in Queensland, but also the impact of Cyclone Yazi in far north Queensland, but also the impact of the rains in Western Australia, in the northwest, and of course the bushfires in Victoria. So this was a traumatic time and a dramatic time uh, in our economy. Now the March quarter balance of payments show a sharp fall in export volumes in the first three months of this year. Export volumes fell by 8.7 per cent in the March quarter. This is the biggest quarterly fall in export, in export volumes in 37 years. This contributed to a widening in the current account deficit of $2.3 billion to $10.4 billion, representing 3 per cent of December quarter GDP. Now, of course, it's no surprise after those disasters that the biggest factor behind today's results was a very significant reduction in coal exports. Coal export volumes fell by $4.6 billion in the March quarter, which were down 26.8 per cent on the previous quarter. Now, of course, a large part of this lost coal production did occur in Queensland, with the Minerals Council estimating that 85 per cent of Queensland's coal mines suffered production losses in the quarter, mainly due to flooding. But of course, there were also significant disruptions, particularly to rail. And of course, as I said before, we had cyclones and heavy rainfall in northwestern Australia earlier this year. Iron ore export volumes were down $1.3 billion, or 7.7 per cent less than the previous quarter. So, of course, the impact of the summer floods and the cyclones and, and the events in Western Australia will take a heavy toll on GDP growth in the March quarter. Overall, net exports are expected to subtract around 2.4 percentage points from growth in the quarter. This is estimated to be the largest quarterly subtraction from GDP growth since records began in 1959. So, Mr Speaker, there has been a dramatic impact on our economy of these natural disasters, and it is somewhat larger than the Treasury initially estimated. But whatever the outcome for the national accounts, the one thing we are absolutely certain of is that the fundamentals of our economy are strong, Mr Speaker. We still have low unemployment at 4.9 per cent, lower than just about every other advanced economy. Strong job creation, over 700,000 jobs created since we came to office, and of course a record terms of trade and an unprecedented pipeline of investment. And that's why it's important to bring the budget back to surplus in 2012-13. That's why it's important to invest in our workforce to build a bigger and better trained workforce. Mr Speaker, this government is absolutely determined Order to get the, the fundamentals for right for our economy so we can turn our success into a stronger economy for all Australians. The member for Flinders. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Given that Professor Garno advocates an increase in petrol prices for households after year one of the carbon tax, will the Prime Minister rule out a new tax on petrol? The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I do genuinely thank the Shadow Minister for the opportunity to answer a further question about the Garno review, because I think it's very important for anyone who is watching Question Time today uh, to not fall for the false premises that are behind the opposition's question. Uh, the opposition is uh, mounting its Question Time. Uh, well, I, I, I certainly wouldn't use the word attack. I wouldn't use the word strategy. I must admit the word uh, would really escapes me. What, anyway, whatever this, uh, whatever this kind of shambolic display is, uh, what it's, uh, what it's uh, trying to do. Uh, number one, what the opposition is trying to do is it's trying to say 
uh, that Professor Garno's review is the government's policy. And uh, it says if the government doesn't agree with that proposition, somehow the government is walking away from Professor Garno. Of course, all of this analysis is a false premise and absolutely absurd, Mr Speaker. So let's be clear Order about Professor Garno's work. Yes, Professor Garno was asked to update his earlier report. We are a government that thinks public policy is best informed when you invite experts to participate and to put forward their views. Professor Garno has put forward his views, and I thank him very much for doing that. But of course, the government will make the decisions about the final design of carbon pricing, and we will work through the uh, multi party climate change committee and our usual cabinet processes to do that. Now, clearly, I understand that those opposite do not like Order. The public policy Prime processes. Prime Minister will resume her place. Order. The member for Flinders on order. The mem Minister for Families. The member for Flinders on a point of order. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. On relevance, the question was whether or not the Prime Minister would rule out a new tax on petrol. Order. Order. The Prime Minister is aware of her responsibility to directly relate her remarks to the question. The Prime Minister. Order. The Prime Minister has the call. Prime Minister. Uh, well, I was asked about a matter dealt with in Professor Garno's report, and I am, and I am clarifying Order. Uh, and dealing Order. with that. And I am definitely going to clarify Order. this point because of the game playing we are seeing from Order. the opposition today. Uh, of course, they don't want Australians to have a rational debate about climate change and carbon pricing, because in the face of a rational debate, their fear campaign runs off the rails. Professor Garno has put his views into the public domain, and they actually deserve a considered public policy response from those opposite. Of course, they'll never get that because those opposite are climate change deniers, and they are determined to run Order. a fear campaign. Order. What Order. we will do with Professor Garno's work is, of course, it is there to inform the public discussion. We will consider it deeply, and the government will make decisions at the appropriate time, and we will outline all of those decisions to the Australian people. But coming to the question Order. that I was asked, can I say this about cost of living and Australian households? The Leader of the Opposition has distorted, Order, today, the member for has distorted today words from a chapter of Professor Garno's work that is called Better Climate, Better Tax. That is, Professor Garno is talking about tax cuts. And what I can Order. certainly say to the House today Order. is as we work through designing household assistance and Order. carbon pricing, tax cuts are a serious option. Yeah, yeah. And to the Leader of the Opposition, I would say what that means is that he has decided to go to the next election uh, ripping assistance out order. of people's hands, taking money order. away the house from will come to order. families. Of course, we understand the cost of living pressures order. on Those Australian families, and we will make the appropriate decisions to generously assist Australian order. families. Prime Minister's time has expired. Order. Order. The very patient member for Macon has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Home Affairs and Justice, and I ask him what action is the government taking to combat illegal and counterfeit tobacco in Australia, and is the minister aware of recent commentary about the size of the illegal tobacco trade in Australia, and what is the government's response? The Minister for Home Affairs and Justice. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the member for Macon for his question? A very good question on uh, World No Tobacco Day. It's a um, it's a good question because I'd like to tell the House that Customs 
through its own uh, very strong regime, has been detecting uh, illegal tobacco in this country for some time and, indeed, been prosecuting those involved in that very illicit trade. Mr Speaker, uh, the government is committed to combating illegal uh, tobacco smuggling in this country. Uh, we work very closely with law enforcement agencies, with states and, indeed, beyond our shores. We work with intelligence agencies to ensure we detect uh, these transnational crimes. And a strong indication of the success uh, since 2007, uh, Mr. Speaker, has been potential revenue losses of customs duty of more than $400 million has been prevented because of the confiscation uh, and detection of these illegal, illegal tobacco um, items. Mr. Speaker. Last year alone, customs was involved in 10 separate uh, tobacco smuggling uh, cases, successfully prosecuting uh, those uh, cases. Um, involving eight custodial sentences, 35 convictions, very hefty penalties and fines for those that have been involved uh, in that behaviour. Mr Speaker, I raise those issues because the tobacco industry, I uh, purport for their own vested interests, have indicated that the problem is larger than it really is. Indeed, the tobacco industry has indicated that one in every, and in every six uh, smokers in this country consume illegal tobacco. That is a, an exaggerated claim, and indeed to rely upon those claims, uh, they uh, base that on reports that have been paid for uh, by the tobacco industry, paid for by themselves. So, Mr. Speaker, not only, not only do they fund the Liberal Party, uh, they also fund self-serving research uh, to, to undermine the facts and indeed to substantiate bogus claims that are being made to scare the public, Mr Speaker, and they are wrong. Indeed, according to the 2007 National Drug Strategy Household Survey, 0.2 per cent have consumed uh, illegal tobacco for most of the time that they smoke. That is 0.2 per cent. The tobacco industry Mr. Speaker, also asserts uh, that uh, plain packaging will lead to a huge increase in criminal offences. Now, that, of course, is not true. That is baseless. Um, the facts are that um, the illegal tobacco smugglers have had ready access to software technology to replicate uh, specific brand packaging for some years. Indeed, they have very sophisticated counterfeit items. Uh, so any transition from specific uh, brand packaging to plain packaging will not in any way, other than perhaps a negligible way, have an effect upon crime in this area. And that's a very important to note, given the scare campaign that's been running. Mr Speaker, um, we know plain packaging will remove the allure, the romance or the glamour that some people see in smoking. Indeed, it will, it, will decline, it will reduce the likelihood, Mr Speaker, of people, young people in particular, in becoming uh, addicts to this particular drug. Now, Mr Speaker, of course, the, the Health Minister has applauded the efforts uh, of the opposition, and I do so too, uh, in coming to the party, even if it is the case that the Leader of the Opposition came to the party kicking and screaming. I'd like to commend the efforts of the Health Minister for her good walk, work. Uh, the member for Moore, the member for Hasluck, those on the other side that knew that this was good public policy didn't do it because of their political interests, Mr Speaker, did it because this is good public policy and this government will continue to do that. And as we continue to do that, of course, Tony Abbott will remain the doctor now of Australian politics. The late Order the Leader of the Nationals. And my question is to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware that the Labor Chief Minister in the Northern Territory wants a 50-year moratorium on the carbon tax? The Labor Premier of Tasmania says the tax is not fair. The Labor Premier of Queensland says she understands people's fears about the carbon tax. And the Labor Premier of South Australia says he has deep concerns about the job losses as a result of the carbon tax. Can the Prime Minister name one Premier who is in favour of her carbon tax? Yeah. Order! Order the House! Order the House will come to order! 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 Order. The Minister. 
member for Goldstein. The minister and the member for Goldstein. Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the uh, Leader of the National Party for his question. And I'm very happy to name people who are in support of pricing carbon. Uh, for example, Order. there's former Prime Minister Order. Howard. For example, there's former Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser. For example, there's former Liberal leader Malcolm Turnbull. For example, there's former Liberal leader Brendan Nelson. For example, there's Andrew Peacock, who took a cut in emissions to an election, and the list goes on and on. As I understand it, the, the leader of the opposition, Order. the prime the minister, was the prime minister was in her seat. Prime Minister has the call. She will be heard in silence. Prime Minister. Uh, the you. member for Hume is warned. Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My understanding is that the Leader of the Opposition is the only living national Liberal leader in this country who is opposed to a price on carbon. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition interjected the member for North before, Sydney is and yes it is, yes it is that the Leader of the Opposition has allowed his political negativity to mean that he has turned his back on the Liberal tradition the of Deputy successful Leader of the Opposition Prime Ministers is like John Howard. Successful Prime Ministers like John Howard, they have walked away from that tradition because they are preferring the path of negativity Order. to putting an idea I in the nation's interest. I declare a general interest. warning. And then, of course, Mr Speaker, I was asked about who I can name who supports carbon pricing. Let me actually The go. member for Patterson is named. The Leader of the House. I move that the member be excused from the services of the House. Order. The question is the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. Vision required. Vision required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
order. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. The ayes will pass the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Shortland and Fowler Tallis for the ayes and the members for uh, Parks and Barker Tallis for the noes. Order. The result of the division is I 71, no 72. The question is therefore negatived. And after question time, I will be taking the time to consider my position. Order. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, I move that this House has confidence in your speakership. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Order. 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 To be order. order. The order. Order. The leader of the opposition would require leave. Well, Mr. To... Speaker, I seek leave uh, to move uh, that this house uh, has confidence in your speakership. Yeah. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Th the leader you. of the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, members opposite uh, for the opportunity to move this motion and. I uh, may not detain the House for quite as long uh, as, uh, as I have on the clock, but, Mr Speaker, um, obviously uh, uh, we have been in uncharted and difficult parliamentary waters uh, ever since uh, the Parliament resumed after the last election. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, in the circumstances where the government uh, cannot uh, naturally command a majority, uh, the job of the Speakership is even more difficult than usual. Now, Mr Speaker, I want to say that under Difficult circumstances, 
you have done your job but with commendable impartiality uh, and with considerable forbearance. I know, Mr Speaker, that all members of this House from time to time try your patience. Uh, I, I know from time to time I do. I suspect from time to time the Prime Minister does. Uh, Mr Speaker, all of us in this House are trying to make political points, as we should, uh, given that this House's job uh, is to determine the great questions before uh, our nation. But, Mr Speaker, I don't think anyone on this side of the House has anything other than respect for the, diff for the job you do under difficult circumstances. And the last thing any of us would want to see uh, is you feel that you have been compromised in your ability to discharge uh, your office uh, by the vote that has just been taken. Whatever we on this side of the House think of a particular decision uh, that you might have just made, we do have deep and abiding confidence in your ability to run this House, Mr Speaker. I want to put it on the record that it is not the opinion of this side of the parliament uh, that anyone uh, could do a better job than you uh, in maintaining uh, the order and the discipline of this House. So you have discharged uh, your, your office very effectively uh, in the previous parliament. If I may say so, uh, Mr Speaker, you have done your job with even more dignity and more assurance and more command in the, in the more difficult circumstances of this parliament. As you know, Mr Speaker, uh, when there was some question uh, as to whether uh, the government would re-nominate you uh, in the uh, weeks after the election, uh, it was the position of the opposition of the coalition that you should be re-nominated, and nothing has changed in the intervening nine months uh, to alter that view of the opposition that you are by far and away uh, the best person uh, to take the chair, that you are by far and away uh, the best person to run what is inevitably a difficult, uh, a difficult uh, uh, to do a difficult job. Uh, in the circumstances of a hung parliament. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, uh, I really do uh, understand uh, how uh, uh, you would be feeling uh, at this present time. Um, you made a call. It was the best call uh, that you uh, could make in your judgment at that time. Uh, on this side of the House, we <coughs> respectfully disagreed with the call that you made. Uh, as it happened, uh, our judgment was backed by the House. But the fact that on this particular occasion, this solitary occasion, uh, your judgment uh, has not been supported by the House, please do not for a moment think that that indicates any want of confidence in your speakership. And that is why I am moving, I am moving this motion. Mr, Mr. Speaker, um, please, please um, do not judge. Uh, what is the appropriate thing to do uh, in the circumstances of this House by what might have been the appropriate thing to do in the circumstances of very different houses. This is, in this respect at least, genuinely a new paradigm. In this respect at least, it is genuinely a new paradigm. And please, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, do not add to the difficulties of this day by feeling that you cannot continue in the chair. Yeah. Is the motion seconded? The Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I rise to second the motion. And of course, Mr Speaker, the government has continuing confidence in you as the Speaker of this Parliament. It's not, a, it's not an easy job. It's uh, definitely not an easy job in contested political circumstances uh, to deal with all of the things that come before you in this Parliament. I understand that and the government understands that and the government understands that you make the best judgment calls you can at the time. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for moving this motion and I am uh, very pleased to second it. Can I say this though, Mr Speaker, we understand that there is a continuing obligation on members of this House, a continuing obligation not just to support this motion but to support your rulings as they are delivered to this parliament. That is an obligation that we will acquit on the government side. Can I say to you, Mr Speaker, I do believe you should take the combined view 
of me and the Leader of the Opposition on this occasion. I understand the precedents that have borne down on these things in the past, but this is a different circumstance, and I believe in this different circumstance, having heard from me and the Leader of the Opposition, you should act differently to speakers in the past. Uh, you should uh, uh, acknowledge that the House has made a decision on this occasion, but that should be the end of it. But I would say this to members of the House who are now presumably uh, behind the Leader of the Opposition and in the exercise of their own independent judgment about to support this confidence motion in you, that the reality is on future occasions not to find ourselves in this position uh, when we are called on to back your judgment in on a matter such as a naming, then the obligation falls on us to do Order. so. Uh, Mr Speaker, Order. that is not something that Order. should be second-guessed if, if people are going Order. to have confidence in the Order. Speaker. Uh, the, the, government has, the, government has in, the government in its conduct today has shown uh, full confidence in you by backing your judgment on the naming, and of course we back this motion now. And my words now, Mr. Speaker, are not directed to you, but they are directed to the opposition. Uh, to provide continuing confidence in the speaker, you need to provide continuing confidence in the speaker's rulings. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, in terms of the vote that we've just had, as I think was very evident by my conduct at the dispatch box, I didn't hear you even name someone. The no noise was so great. I am not able to say, standing at this dispatch box, what you named them for. I couldn't hear that either uh, because the level of noise was so great. Uh, but of course, I exercised my vote and the government Order. exercised its vote the way that we did because to provide confidence to the Speaker requires providing confidence in individual rulings of the Speaker. And whether or not we are in a position to judge as individuals the circumstances of any individual ruling, we provided that confidence. That is the attitude that the government will continue to take to providing confidence in you. And I would ask members of the opposition to reflect on that for the future. As for today, Mr Speaker, we are where we are, and the Leader of the Opposition Order. has taken Order. the appropriate action, Order. given the way in which the uh, Opposition has cast its votes. Uh, in those circumstances, I think the Leader of the Opposition has done the right thing, which is why I am prepared to second the resolution Order. to confirm to you that the government has complete confidence in you continuing, and I believe, having heard from both me and the Leader of the Opposition, you should accept that display of confidence uh, in the full exercise of your good judgment on this matter. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. The member for Lyne. Speaker, and I know there's a great deal of interest in this particular parliament, uh, in six particular members of uh, this parliament, and uh, in light of that, uh, it is worth putting on the record uh, the support in the full confidence of your continuing role uh, in, in the chair as Speaker. Uh, and it is important in this parliament uh, to, I think, uh, have some reflection and backing up the words of the previous Speaker, the Prime Minister, in consideration of the uh, place that naming has uh, in uh, the uh, full life of the 43rd Parliament, because the position that I just took, for example, is not without precedent. It's the same position I have taken before in regards naming, and that is where possible, in my view, to defend a private member's rights within this chamber. You will see that consistently uh, in regards issues such as the gag, uh, in the full range of issues in, in regards uh, the rights of private members in this chamber. And if I don't hear or see a particular issue that leads to a member being named, uh, then uh, I would have difficulty doing anything else other than defending those members' rights. So my position uh, is not without precedent, but I don't think it then necessarily takes the next step in this 43rd parliament, which is incredibly tight, 
of leading to a lack of confidence in your position as Speaker of this chamber. So I appreciate the motion being moved. I think it is appropriate that we do clarify this, and I would hope, uh, as a consequence of that, we do see the House today once again express full confidence uh, in your ongoing role uh, as Speaker in this chamber. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I, I thank the House. Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Uh, I think, uh, Mr Speaker, it might be an appropriate opportunity to ask that further questions be placed on the notice page. Order. Order. Before, order. I'm sorry to interrupt members, and this is totally unrelated to, to events. Um, it, it's my sad duty to inform the House of the death yesterday of an officer of the House of Representatives, Mr Peter Buckley. Peter joined the department on 8 September 1969 and was a member of staff upon, and, until his death, to the time of his death. A career of over 41 years made him the longest serving officer of the department. Nobody associated with the Australian parliament today has known life within this parliament without Peter. He was a good humoured, courageous, given his increasing physical limitations. He, uh, members, might remember Peter uh, as he zipped around the halls on his red electric scooter. This led to some of, of us, including myself, referring to him as Fangio. Peter was extremely well liked and well respected by all. Um, his work colleagues within the House Department have been greatly affected by the loss of such a loyal and cheerful colleague. Um, on behalf of the House, I extend sincere condolences to Peter's family and his many friends, especially uh, his work colleagues within the department. And I, as a mark of respect, I would ask members to rise in their places. I thank the House. Order. The member for Canning is indicating that he's got a question for me. Uh, the Deputy Leader and the Opposition, the member for Sturt. Sorry. The Mr. member for Canning. Mr Speaker, understanding Order 105B, um, I requested you write to the Minister for School, Education, Early Childhood and Youth, the Honourable Peter Garrett seek the reasons for the delay in responding to my questions on notice. Questions number 319 and 320 appear on the notice paper on the 24th, 24th of March 2011. Order. I will write to the minister as required. The, if there are no other questions for me, the member for Tangney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I rise for a personal explanation. Does the member claim to have been misrepresented? Most grievously. The member for Tangney. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Today, the Minister for Climate Change accused me of misleading the House by saying that global average temperatures had not increased in 10 years. I suggest the Minister go to the data of the, on global average temperatures Order. with a Hadley Centre Order. and do a linear regression further. Professor Will Stephan, head of the government's own climate change uh, or own climate change adviser, in an interview with Andrew Bolt, repeatedly refused to contradict Bolt's statement that the globe hadn't warmed in 10 years, despite but, uh, being invited the to do so. The member is now straying into debate. Order. I present the following Auditor Generals 
performance audit reports for 2010-11, number 45, administration of the luxury car tax, and number 46, management of student visas. The Leader of the House. I move that the reports be made parliamentary papers. Order. The question is that the reports be made parliamentary papers. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no, I think the ayes have it. The Leader of the House. Mr. Doc Mr Speaker, documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today. I move the House take note of document number two. Full details of the documents will be recorded in the votes and proceedings in Hansard. Order. The question is that the House take note of the paper. The member for Cowper. I move the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is that the debate be adjourned and the adjourned debate be made an order of the day for the next day of sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it.